resources. The, the prototypical examples are sort of, um, you know, common resources like fisheries, forests, land, um, things like that. And the idea here is that um, you can't prevent other people from fishing, but uh, they're rivalrous because if I fish for some fish, then you don't get those fish, right? Now, public goods are different. They're non-excludable and they're non-rivalrous. These are things like highways, the national defense, um, these things that are broadcast over the airways. In other words, there are things that we can't exclude people from. They're also not rivalrous because multiple people can enjoy them at the same time. So that's the basic terminology. This just set up the debate. So in Open Ed 2018, Wiley gives this talk called Questioning the OER Orthodoxy. Is commons the right metaphor for the work we do in OER? He says, no. He says, it's not the right metaphor. We should think of OER as a public good not a common pool resource. And the reason is because OER is non-rivalrous. And more importantly, OER doesn't face the key problem of, of, uh, of common pool resources, which is enclosure. That is um, a private or public entity sort of capturing and privatizing the resource. He says that's not possible because the license is perpetual. And we don't need collaboration to manage the resource because once you put it out there, anybody can use it. So that's Wiley's argument. In 2019, Jim Luke comes back and says, no, 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 you're thinking about it wrong. We need to talk about OER sustainability in terms of a commons. And what we have to realize is that the, the open educational resources aren't the resource. They're actually byproducts of the underlying resource. And the underlying resource is the academy, professors, students, the collective pursuit of knowledge, which is a learning commons. The commons produces a byproduct, which is the open educational resources. And in fact, these products suffer from many of the problems that face uh, common pool resources. In fact, he thinks they do suffer from the problem of enclosure from uneven distribution, and from a lack of reciprocity sharing and mission-driven principles. So we need values to govern, govern the commons, Luke says. The, thing, the reason why this is important is because it lands Wiley and Luke in two very different sort of places. So if you believe that, uh, Open educational resources are primary a public good. They don't have the problem. We don't, we're not gonna run out of them. Um, you know, we're not gonna use them up. Um, the, the, the license means that they're there forever. What we really need to do is focus our energy and time in getting money to encourage production of those resources. The problem is not overconsumption; it's under production. We need to increase funding, either through private or public means. And the chief threat to OER is free riding, David Wiley says. It's, it's, that, it's that people enjoy the resources without contributing to them. That's the chief problem. So we need to solve that problem and stop focusing on the common stuff. That's Wiley's argument here. And it, and it aligns with, with what Wiley has done himself professionally, right? So David Wiley founded a, um, a company to make open educational resources very easily accessible to people. And, and, he, and, and he has sought public money and private money through foundations to, to support the development of the resources that Lumen Learning provides. He also services a private revenue model, a for-profit revenue model um, by charging students access codes to their resources. So Wiley firmly believes that this is the way OER should go. And in fact, you know, um, he has been very public that he thinks the future of OER lies in getting the big publishers, the Cengages, the McCraw Hills, the, um, the Pearsons of the world to start producing OER. And that's the way we'll really mainstream OER and spread it globally. That's Wiley's position. Luke, on the other hand, sees it very differently because he takes this commons approach. He says, no, no, the chief goals of OER should be based around stewardship. And this is involved emphasizing the values and the, and the, and the community norms 
around using educational products and resources. We need to increase reciprocity so that um, what's used by teachers and learners gets shared back to other teachers and learners. We need to empower faculty to create and share. He sees the chief threat to OER as corporatization and monetization of resources. So in fact, he lands at the exact opposite place as Wiley. He sees the, that, that the big publishers moving into the open education space actually present a threat because they don't share the common values of open education that the community holds. So you can see that even though this is kind of an abstract debate and may seem like a semantic argument, it has very real consequences in terms of the work we do. So what I did is kind of wanted to understand more about this and take a step back and to understand where talk about the commons comes from. If you just look at the face of it, if you go back to that matrix here, actually I'll do this, um, go back to this matrix here. It seems that Wiley's correct, right? After all, technically speaking, an open educational resource is non-excludable. It's published on the web. Anybody can get to it. There's not barriers. We, we in fact, most of the time say that OER shouldn't be behind a paywall. Um, and then it's non-rivalrous, right? Because if you download a PDF or OER for your class, I can download the same PDF and OER for my class. There's no problem. We haven't depleted the resource by using the OER. So if you look at this sort of basic Econ 101 matrix, it looks like Wiley's just correct, right? What's Luke talking about? So to understand why, why we might think that open educational resources and open education is a commons, goes back to the work of Eleanor Ostrom and a number of others. So uh, this idea of a knowledge commons. And so I went back to read this uh, collection of essays, um, which is not like a typical collection of essays, like a typical anthology. This one was created with a purpose. It had it, its authors were, were sort of united with a goal. And so the, the essays fit together quite nicely. It, it, it reads a little bit more like a monograph. Um, what, what they argue in this book is basically that um, if we look at the history of commons, what we see is that when, when communities share resources in common, that they actually develop a complex system of practices to govern those resources. That, they're, that these vary locally and that there are different governance structures that represent the stakeholders, the people who have a stake in the commons. They also have local enforcement mechanisms and ways of dealing with um, disputes. And there's a participatory or democratic process for setting those norms and for resolving disputes. And they say in this work that, that we should think of knowledge collectively in the big sense, knowledge in the sense of, of the broad information structures that inform science and technology, education, the humanities, all the things that, that, that we think as sort of the core mission of, uh, of the academy, of the colleges and universities. We should think of knowledge as a commons resource. The reason is because knowledge is fundamentally shared, collaborative, and then it requires preservation, sustaining, that knowledge isn't just the data, it isn't the works, it's those shared practices, standards, and know-how that allow us to understand how to implement that. Additionally, knowledge is best informed when it's cross-disciplinary. So we have to share, share knowledge across disciplines, and that's when we're most effective. So, <clears throat> Some examples of this that you, you know, I pull from areas that I'm sure you're familiar with. So if you're a librarian or you work in scholarly communications, you understand how libraries provide this kind of knowledge commons framework, right? And um, the goal is to curate and provide easy access to um, resources that are shared in common. And it, <clears throat> that requires maintenance and it requires norms and it requires professional standards to do that well. 
We've also seen with increased digitization that there was a promise of greater accessibility to these common resources. But in fact, with things like digital rights management and other legal constriction on library access, for instance, internet filters in the K through 12 space, or in the US, the Patriot Act, which all sort of were legal barriers that, sought, that have created enclosures and have erected barriers to the access of those digital resources. And in response, librarians have embraced the open access movement to try to recommon the library. <clears throat> Additionally, librarians understand perfectly well that it takes work to preserve and to maintain continuity of digital resources because links get broken, because uh, even digital resources degrade over time, that it requires activity to maintain a knowledge commons. Another example is Wikipedia, volunteer-based production of encyclopedic information, very heavily relies on community standards, moderation, and editing norms. Um, <clears throat> similarly, look at learning communities, conferences, scholarly associations, again, largely sustained through fees, registration fees, contributions from members, volunteer services. There are community standards and practices. This starts to resemble a commons. And I think this is really important because if we think about education as it confronts sort of the market and capitalist sort of space of private property, we find that in fact, there's a tension there. So think to Paulo Freire's banking model of education. The idea that with the classic idea of education that the teacher is a dispensary of knowledge and students are to receive the knowledge in a passive way. This is exclusionary. It requires on gatekeeping um, measures, right? So this is why credentials are so important, for instance. Whereas true education is generally more collaborative, it benefits from greater democratization rather than hierarchization. Similarly, capitalist private enterprise has this kind of ongoing and extractive and accumulative impulse. Whereas education is actually contagious, it's, it's amplitude. That is when, when you create a space for learners, more people learn, you don't tend to accumulate and enclose. Education benefits, therefore, from greater openness. So in fact, the values of education are more aligned with openness and less aligned with that private property force. And instead, in, in feed, we see this all the time with the problems with intellectual property around our ability to advance our educational mission. So I think this is why it's really important to think of our work as a commons work, a commoning work, a verb. OER is a verb, is a, a great example of a commons, by the way. Earlier today, saw the presentation from um, the National Humanities Center in, um, in, in North Carolina, and they are doing excellent work uh, in a commons framework. They talk about the values, they talk about the fact that commoning is a verb. Their repository, incidentally, is behind a, a, a login. You can't, it's not accessible by Google. So it's not, it, in some sense, they have intentionally enclosed their commons so they can enforce the community standards. Uh, an attempt was made to do this writ large through the CARE framework. Um, you can visit this on the web at thecareframework.org where they've articulated values that govern OER, contributing, empowering, attributing, releasing the works. And we've gone through, I was at part of a group that kind of went through a type of revision of the care framework where we recognize that now privacy policy and data usage should be included within our understanding of what uh, good open educational resources should, should have. The important thing is that to realize that OER and open is about more than just the artifacts, more than the, 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 the digital or paper uh, textbooks. It's about teaching and learning practices. It's about the production and dissemination of knowledge that, and those practices and know-how have to be shared through a community. So even though OER, the artifacts, the textbooks behave like public goods, and they certainly do need funding to enable their production. And open education as a practice, 
as a set of values, as a way of teaching and learning, I think genuinely is a commons. Um, and we need to think about it in those terms. And we need to really think about the threat of enclosures, the ways in which OER are pu pulled into closed systems, into software uh, repositories that are not open themselves, uh, into extractive practices like data mining and, um, and other, uh, other services that are at odds with the, uh, the values of education. So that's all I have. I'd be, uh, be really interested to hear some, some questions if you have any. And I think we have like uh, a few minutes left, maybe five, four or five minutes. First, I'd like to make sure we say a thank you for uh, Professor Nathan Smith for presenting to us. I think he's provided some insightful information I, uh, and some great research. I think that was pretty uh, informative uh, and just uh, a lot of food for thought. I, I didn't have any idea or expectations for this um uh this for this speaking engagement and i really enjoyed listening to that i hope everybody did too if you have questions you can unmute yourself i don't think we'll bounce over everybody if you have a chance you want to speak with nathan uh, please unmute your mic and ask your question or i won't bite i promise Good, good. Yeah, I think, I mean, if I just to kind of reemphasize kind of, I think my main point here is, is that, um, you know, I think we get into OER, sometimes the hook is, you know, free digital resources, um, or low cost, or we're going to save students money. And I think that's, you know, certainly that's part of it. That's part of reducing barriers and in increasing access. But I think, the more transformative piece of open education is this idea of, of reforming the knowledge transmission model, right? Um, like in the traditional publisher-based model, we have uh, designated knowledge creators, authors, who then go through a gatekeeping process of the publisher, right? And then the publisher disseminates to the, either directly to faculty instructors and the faculty instructors then become a kind of transmission device, right? They just transmit the information onto students who then receive it. That one way sort of unidirectional model, I think, is a lot of what I think leads to for faculty, a sense of like, why am I doing this? Why I just go in, you know, and, and, I, and I, I just repeat the stuff that, that the publishers told me, right? Already, or that's in the textbook. Um, the student really feels disengaged, like, okay, well, I just, what's going to be on the test? Uh, is this going to impact my grade? Like, whereas if we think of knowledge as a knowledge creation, as a process of collaboration, and we actually use resources that enable students and faculty to modify, adapt, and create and add to our collective knowledge materials, I think we really have a chance to transform the way we think about teaching and learning, the way we think about education. And I think that's the real power of OER. I'd have to agree. I think the, the sharing concept of education is gonna be transformative, transformative for our uh, learning communities. Um, we're coming up on the time frame. Uh, if you have any uh, other questions, um, please feel free to reach out to me if you like. Uh, I'm putting my email address in here and I can trans um let's share that with our, our group uh and and with nathan and i'd be happy to uh answer any other additional questions if i can thank you uh, professor smith oh you bet thanks y'all thanks for being here enjoy the rest of the conference um uh, yeah yeah i mean so the lms is tough i mean someone asked uh, yvonne if you don't mind I'm, I'm happy to hang out for a couple minutes and answer questions as they come in yvonne in the chat asked about the LMS as part of the commons. And I think the LMS is a challenge because um, while the LMS is a nice tool for us to, um, to, to use, to track and engage with students and put our assignments and all of that, it is a, it is a uh, walled garden. It's, a, it's an enclosure, right? Now that can be useful in, when we're thinking about commons. So we can think about creating norms and practices within the LMS 
we can think of that space of the classroom as a kind of commons. But I think students are more benefited by engaging with the outside and drawing that in. And so whether that's through using uh, other kind of like, some people do open, open web projects like blogs, uh, websites um, where you engage students on the open web, where they're actually publishing their materials, um, or you're engaging in open pedagogy projects where students are actually creating materials that are then being either enfolded into the course in the textbook or are being published out to the public. Um, these are ways of kind of expanding and engaging students in the broader knowledge commons outside of the classroom. And I think that's really useful. All right, well, I'm gonna let y'all get to your next session here. I'll stop sharing. And, um... Yes, thank you so much. I'd love to have a chance, if there's a chance to email with you, Nathan, because I yes. have further questions about your notion of Google as whether well, it's a comments of brother, because then we have to reconcile all these notions of privacy, et cetera, et cetera. So I love to pick up this topic later with you. You, uh, this is a this is a great question. I mean, I think this is the this is the challenge of the internet today is that yes. um, virtually every tool we use on the web get, is getting captured by a few companies that basically are are extracting our um, data for um, for advertising. Um, and so I think you know we really have to be careful about this. And I I don't have great answers. I mean, you know, the real the thing the that would be great to kind of discover or figure out is like what's the platform that that is that is representative of our values, and I, I haven't seen it yet. So so if, you know I but I'm interested in chatting more about it. So yeah, Yvonne, I'll put my um, email in the chat and and you can reach out to me. I'm also on Twitter at um, SmithND, and um, you know feel free to chat either place. Sure, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, I'm gonna go ahead. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, stop the recording. Thank you. <laughs>